Welcome to part three of our Powered by Swift Tech water cooling guide. This is going to be the part where we actually talk less about visualization, although there will be some visualization, and more about the actual installation of the tubing and the fluid and the fittings that are going to make your water cooling system complete, and we're even going to fill the thing up with water. <laughs> So let's go through all the parts that we're going to need. I've got my double-sided Velcro, which I'm going to use to mount my radiator and my reservoir. I've got all my blocks installed, so if you haven't watched parts one and two of the water cooling guide, you should definitely go check those out before you watch this part. I have some pretty cool cables. So these are from BitPhoenix. These are their individually sleeved cables. You can also get them from NZXT. And I'm going to be using those for my 24-pin connector here, just to make it look a little bit more slick as part of my cabling. And then we've got green cathode lights that are going to give us some cool lighting effects. We've got our right angle fittings. Just in case we end up needing to make some tight curves, you should have a couple of these on hand no matter what. We've also got an SLI fitting. So these can be adjusted slightly and they help to bridge the gap between your two SLI cards because it can be tough to get normal compression fittings and tubing in between there and have the whole thing be secure. So we've got our compression fittings for everything else, our SLI fitting for between the video cards, and some right angle fittings just in case we have some tight squeezes. We've also got our green uh, tubing, our green fluid, although the only place we'll see the fluid is in the reservoir itself, and finally our graphics cards, which as you can see are EVGA classified GTX 590s. The blocks are installed, we just need to get them actually installed into the case and then we're ready to start laying things out. Let's run through a quick tool checklist. So, I've got my Phillips head screwdriver, which you're pretty much going to need for any PC project. I've also got a crescent wrench. This is an adjustable one because you never know what kind of sizes you're going to run into with water cooling fittings. I have a set of Allen keys and I have a very specific use for these to do with the Apogee XT water block. A nice robust pair of scissors for cutting up your tubing. Some cable clippers for the cable ties that you will undoubtedly need in order to manage your cables. And finally, a pair of vice grips. So vice grips I use for compression fittings and I will show you exactly how I do that without damaging them a little bit later. Before we start doing tubing runs, I'm just going to get all of my fittings installed. So in the case of the Apple GXT, I am using 3 8 inch compression fittings, which means that in its stock configuration, with the inlet hole in the center, it will not actually fit. I won't be able to fit the compression fittings next to each other. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking out the six Allen keys around the outside of that fitting. I'm going to be switching it around and then I'm going to be reinstalling it so that they are a little bit further apart and they will fit. Just a word of warning guys, whenever you are making any changes to the stock configuration of a water block, there are usually O-ring seals. You should be very careful of those to replace them exactly the way you found them so that you don't run into a leaking problem before. It's also not a bad idea to test the block before you even disassemble it to make sure that there are no issues with it already. So for this guide we are using silver compression fittings, that is silver plated. The reason for that is that silver acts as a natural biocide which is going to keep gunk from growing in your loop. So these are compression fittings which means we're going to take them apart and we're only going to install the base of them which looks a lot like a barb fitting into our blocks, radiators and reservoirs. So we go ahead and thread these G1 quarter fittings into all of our blocks just lightly, finger tight to start. So I'm going to go ahead and grab another one here. Take off the top and thread that in to the block. As long as you buy all G1 quarter fittings and um, components then you should be good in terms of compatibility as long as you watch out for the sizes because remember when that was in the middle these two weren't both going to fit and be able to be tightened properly. Now once those are installed finger tight what I always do although not everyone believes in this is I take my vice grips I wrap the bottoms of my fittings with a cloth or something soft just like that so that I'm not going to crush the, uh, the finish on them because then the whole point of compression fittings is going to be defeated and then I give them about another eighth of a turn just for a bit, little bit of extra tightness without damaging them. 
Now something else to watch out for when you're installing fittings, so we've done our CPU block now. Radiators are no problem with this, but sometimes some specialty blocks, like for example this memory block, do not have very deep threads. And so you'll come in here and have a close up look. So what that means is have a look at these two fittings. You can see the positioning of the O-rings and how the one in my left hand has threads that are about twice as long as the one in my right hand. So if I was going to go ahead and use this fitting in this block, I would want to use a spacer to ensure that the threads don't go in so deep that they compress down onto the copper plate at the bottom and completely restrict the flow. So the ones that I am using for this guide don't require it, but it is still something that I wanted you guys to be aware of so that you don't run into that problem when you're doing this sort of thing on your own. Now we've got our regular compressions installed on all of the blocks for our build, but I have a special fitting here that I'm going to be using for the video cards. So this is an SLI fitting. Uh, basically what it does is it sits between the two blocks just like this because it's a lot of work to get two compressions and tubing in such a small space. Um, the, this particular kit actually comes with three different sizes of SLI fittings, so you can use it no matter what your spacing is between your graphics cards. So in this case, you can see here that the fitting that goes on the graphics card has two O-rings inside, which is going to allow it to form a nice tight seal once you slip the middle piece in between. So you just take your graphics card, you install it on the one side, so I'm going to go ahead and screw that in there, and then you're probably going to need a friend to help you with this because it can get a little bit tricky, but you take your other graphics card, so here, let me just get a good grip on this guy before I try and attempt this on camera. Here, why don't I just bring it down to the edge of the table? That makes it easier. So you take your two graphics cards, you squeeze them together so you got a good seal, and then you take the whole thing and install it in your case all at the same time. Now we've done the system wiring. If you guys don't know how to wire a system, first of all, you're probably not quite ready for water cooling yet. And second of all, we do have a video where you can learn how to wire up your system. There's a cable management guide, and there's also a system build guide. So what we're doing right now is I've got my quadruple radiator, which I am going to mount in the basement of my case. Now, two things I have to watch out for when I'm positioning the radiator. One is these notches right here at the bottom of the case. I want to make sure my side panel is still going to fit on without it interfering uh, with the radiator. And second, I also want to find that balance so that I'm optimizing the amount of space on the other side of the radiator to manage tubing, manage wires, and place my reservoir and pump. Last but not least, remember I have a solid power supply over here on this side, so I want the radiator as close to the front of the case as I can get it without interfering with the curve so that it can push air through the outside of the bottom of the TJ11 without just blowing it directly at the PSU and then out the back here, which is not quite as efficient. So I've got my double-sided Velcro on there. Just push that down to secure it, and you can see that's not going anywhere at this point in time. So here on the back, you can see our cable management for the most part. We've got all of our fan headers on the radiator fans, which need to be hooked up to something. We've also got our 24 pin cable which is just going to be kind of tucked somewhere out of the way. We've also got our pump which needs to go right about here. So I've got my double sided tape on the bottom which acts to help mount it as well as helping to, hold on, there we go, as well as helping to reduce any vibrations. So I'm just going to tuck my 24 pin connector up against it. And then last but not least, we've got our reservoir, which is probably going to sit sort of somewhere in this sort of neighborhood. Haven't quite figured out exactly where that's going to go, because um, what I might end up doing is using one of these 90 degree fittings in order to have the pump feed, or the reservoir feed directly into the pump. See like this, 90 degree fitting here and then that'll point that way, and then I might take the radiator and have that flow directly into the reservoir and position it right here, but just not quite sure yet. Now for this section, I cannot stress enough the importance of visualization again. I know I've talked about this, but here we are, we're using our 3 8 inch inner diameter, 5 8 inch outer diameter. I guess I never mentioned this, but you want to make sure that the fittings you have are compatible with both the inner diameter and the outer diameter of your tubing before you get started. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at our build and we're going to figure out what is the best path for the tubing to follow for the most aesthetic appeal because 
here's something that a lot of people don't know. We've got one radiator here, two radiator here, and we've got one, two, three, four things that we're cooling with water blocks. So people might say, oh, well, you take your big radiator and you make sure that that one goes before your CPU and then do the RAM and then do another radiator and then go to the video cards. Actually, it doesn't matter. The difference in temperature between the hot, the water in the hottest part of your loop and the coldest part of your loop is never more than about 0.1 degree. It's moving so fast that it's more of a just how much heat the water is carrying as a whole rather than thinking about the water as the well the water that's in the block and then moving this way you can't really think of it that way so we're going to focus on the visual appeal now for me the best visual appeal comes when you have as few crosses in the tubing as possible so we're going to go out of our pump which is in the basement right about here we're going to come out this gap right here go into our ram block come out of our ram block go into our radiator up here come out of this rad go into the inlet and come out of the outlet, go into the inlet, goes through the SLI fitting, then we're gonna bring this one down and plug that into our reservoir and our pump, however, ends up working. When installing tubing, I always do my short runs up from component to component first, followed by my long runs that go down to the cooling basement. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys how you put tubing over a barb. So there we go. And then once it's installed onto the barb, you just take your compression, and screw it on. So this is taking the outside of the tubing and pinching it over the inside of the tubing to provide a nice tight seal. Compression fittings look great and they're very, very secure. You don't have to go all the way down, just finger tight is enough. Now another thing that's really important when you're running tubing is to use runs that are as short as possible when you are cutting it. So you wanna go ahead and line it up with where you need to go, mark it, and then make as straight a cut as possible with as little extra tubing as possible while ensuring that you do still have enough. This is going to give you a very clean look versus having extra tubing left over once you go from one place to another. There you have it, and it'll look much more straight and much like a much cleaner line. Another thing is if you're having trouble getting the tubing over the fittings, you can dip it in hot water, which is what we're gonna have to do to get three inch eighths tubing over the half inch barbs that are built into the MCP655 pump. Now I'm gonna show you guys one particular trick, which is how to put the three eighths inch tubing over the half inch barbs on the pump. But I also wanna talk a little bit about the layout that I use down here in the bottom. So you can see the tubing that's coming down from the end of my loop, so the inlet, I'm feeding into the bottom port on the radiator. Now radiators aren't going to have more or less restriction or more or less performance based on which port is the inlet and which is the outlet. But the reason I've done that is because with the radiator laying on its side, it's going to be much easier for the air bubbles to float up and come out of the radiator into the reservoir this way versus if I did it the other way around. It would be much more difficult to bleed out the air bubbles from the loop. Now the other thing that I've done is I've gone directly from my reservoir into the pump. This step is critical. You should always have your reservoir directly immediately before the pump so that the pump never runs dry. Now my pump is plugged in, but if you were gonna power on the system with the pump plugged in and no water running through it, you can damage it very, very quickly. So last but not least, I'm just gonna show you guys the tricks that are involved. So the first thing you do is take some hot water, dip the tubing into the hot water to soften it a little bit. A couple of seconds is fine. Then you can take some pliers and you can stretch out the inside of the tubing just like this. I usually do from at least four directions to ensure that I'm stretching it enough that I'm gonna be able to fit it over that large barb fitting on the pump itself. Even then, it's still going to be a bit of a challenge. So you just wanna kind of go at it from an angle. And once you've got it on, then you can kind of shimmy it down as long as you go far enough there you go, that you can take a zip tie, and you can see we've done this with the top one already, and tie it around here to ensure that it will not come off. Now, whenever you're filling, you're gonna need a couple of things. First of all, you will need a, something to jumper your power supply. So in this case, we're going to be using a paper clip, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna bridge the green wire on your power supply to any one of the black wires. So I'm gonna go like this. Please note my power supply is still powered off, what you're doing is you are causing the power supply, there we are, to be turned on without the system actually powered on. This is critical because it will allow you to do a leak test 
without the risk of damaging your components because even if a little bit of water gets on them during the leak test, as long as they're not powered on and you give them ample time to dry out after you're done, you shouldn't have any problems. You'll also need either a funnel or a container with a spout at the top in order to fill up the reservoir and then you're pretty much ready to go. So we're going to go ahead and open up our res and we'll show you sort of a couple cycles here and then the rest is pretty much, well, rinse and repeat of the same thing. So I'm actually, you know, I'm going to stay on this side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over and I'm going to start filling up my reservoir. So as I said before, you want to make sure the pump never runs dry. So that means I have to elevate my reservoir to the point where the water is going to flow down that bottom outlet on the res and flood the pump before I start. Once I've filled up the res completely, turn this back over, and all I have to do is flip the switch on the back of my power supply. I'm going to do that a couple times. I'm going to let some bubbles run out of the res, or run out of the pump. There we go. I'm going to go again. I'm going to go again. So what you're going to do is you're going to power cycle the system a number of times like this. And every time the reservoir gets empty or near empty, you're going to go ahead and fill it back up. The whole process probably takes about 20 minutes. Now the system is full enough at this point that the water is cycling through continuously. However, there are still large air bubbles, visible air bubbles in many parts of the loop. Can you see that right there with the air bubbles inside? Here, I'm just going to tilt that up a little bit so you can see the air bubbles. I can loosen them by... Uh, hitting it with the screwdriver there, you can see that. So what we're going to do in order to loosen up those air bubbles we're, is we're going to play around with the speed of the pump. So right here at the back of this particular pump there is a variable speed dial. So if I turn up the speed, I want you to watch the reservoir for this part. Because what you're going to see is when I turn the speed up, I'm going to crank it up now, all the way to high. Here come some bubbles. So I'm going to wait a little while for some of those to bleed out. And then I'm going to turn it all the way down. Then I'm going to crank it back up. And if you do this for a little while, it can accelerate the process of bleeding out the air. Usually once the system's full enough to cycle through the water, you've probably got about another res worth to still fill once you've freed up some of those bubbles. Another thing you can do to free up bubbles is give the system a bit of a shake to loosen them. And then you can also try tilting the system in different ways if there are particularly persistent bubbles that you're having trouble getting rid of. So this process will probably take about another 20 minutes to half an hour. Now this shot's going to serve a couple purposes. First, we're going to finish up our water cooling guide. And second, we're going to springboard into an upcoming NCIX Tech Tips episode, which is our new Extreme Buyer's Guide. We did one back a little while ago, but I would definitely consider this machine to be a new Extreme Buyer's Machine with the price tag to match. So I just want to sort of walk you guys through a couple of things here to finish up the water cooling segment though. So on the screen behind me, I've got a couple things running right now. I'm just going to take this headset off so I can hear myself talk. And here you can see I've got the Windows Task Manager which has all 12 threads of my 6 core 12 thread CPU pegged to the max. I'm running Prime 95 small FFT and you can see my temperatures are in the 75 to 80 degree range. Now this is at a CPU clock speed of 4.6 gigahertz. This is 100% stable and so yes we can achieve better CPU temperatures than that but by turning up the voltage of the CPU and overclocking it we are still able to maintain reasonable temperatures so those are still within Intel spec reasonable temperatures an obscene overclock of more than one gigahertz and here I'll lean close to the system very very quiet operation that is the beauty of water cooling everything runs cool everything runs quiet you take all the heat away from your components, you disperse it with large 120 millimeter fans, and you don't have any of that high-pitched whine that is associated normally with high-speed fans and overclocking and all that good stuff. So that is pretty much it for the CPU portion. Now what we're going to do is we're going to fire up a game and we're going to show you guys how hot these quad SLI GTX 590s get under gaming load. 
So guys, the point of this part of the video is going to be to show some Battlefield 3. Actually, oh, shoot, I shouldn't have hit that button. Let's show some Battlefield 3 performance. So this is running at 1080p with the high presets, um, with our DTX 590 Quad SLI, our 990X at, uh, what are we at, 4.66 gigahertz? Is that right? Yeah, I think so. 4.66 gigahertz, and I'm, oh, I'm getting lost here. So I'm running this with the all-new Corsair K90 and M90 keyboard and mouse. I'm also running my Vengeance 1300 headset here because remember the onboard audio on Gigabyte G1 series boards is significantly better than what you can expect from other motherboards. So I would opt for the analog version of the headset versus the USB version. So you can see my FPS up in the top corner here. So this is just absolutely blowing away anything else that I ran during my Battlefield 3 performance video card roundup. Uh, and that makes sense because I did not test Quad SLI during that video. And I am running Quad SLI now. I died. But that's not really the point of this segment of the video because what I want to do is show you guys. Uh, start task manager. I want to show you guys MSI Afterburner, which has my video cards at 55 degrees under gaming load. Hold on, let me just move that up. 55 degrees under gaming load. One, two, three. Oh, wow, the other GPU is even lower, about 50 degrees. So we probably got a slightly better mount on that one. Um, compared to what you'll typically see on a GTX 590, which is in excess of 90 degrees under gaming load. So besides that, instead of having the fans on the cards themselves, we're doing all the cooling with the radiator. And that is how we are achieving that outstanding graphics card cooling performance. I think that pretty much wraps up our ultimate water cooling guide. You know what, at the end of the video, we're just going to do a bit of a montage of some glamour shots. So we'll do some daylight shots of the cards, the blocks, the motherboard. We'll do some nighttime shots. So we'll probably do about a minute or so of footage of that. So stay tuned for a little bit more so you can get a really close look at the water cooled machine now that we're done.